ask all of you to, I know everybody wants to express themselves, but let's all be polite and try to have a dialogue here. I, I think that's the most constructive way, and I'm sure that we can make our feelings known without booing, without drowning people out with applause. I want to make sure that everybody can hear. Uh, we are also going to be, um, we're videotaping this, and we're going to be broadcasting it so that anyone who wasn't here who's interested will be, have an opportunity to watch and they can certainly always send comments directly to my office, to the senator's office, to any of us up here if they have questions from home. Unfortunately, we can't live tweet this today because of new ADA requirements about subtitling. So we will have this subtitled and up on the web as soon as we can get the subtitling done. Uh, first of all, I want to thank LA City College for hosting this event and having us all here really appreciate having this great resource here in Los Angeles and them keeping it open to the community. I also want to thank the Sheriff's Department for keeping us all safe. Um, and with that, I'm going to, in a minute, allow all of the panelists to introduce themselves, but I'm going to make just a couple of opening comments. Um, when I first ran for the Glendale City Council in 2009, there were a lot of big issues that people had, but housing was not at the top of the list for most people. I can tell you today, if I canvass any part of Los Angeles, which I did when I ran for this office, housing is the number one issue for pretty much everybody. Whether it's someone who is rent insecure or worried that something's gonna happen to their building, their rent controlled building or their stabilized building or a building that they've been in for a long time and they're worried that someone's gonna raise the rent or knock the building down to build something else, everyone's afraid of that. And even people that are single family homeowners who own their homes are seeing what's happening with their friends and neighbors who are, ha are more and more finding that their cost of living is driving them into poverty or driving them onto the streets. And every one of us, I think, has had the experience of driving down the street and having our heart broken by what we see with the growing number of homeless residents of Los Angeles. Uh, there's no one out there that's not impacted by this. So last year, the legislature had hun literally hundreds of bills trying to deal with the housing crisis, and 15 bills that were enacted to improve the, develop, uh, to improve the ability to develop more housing in California. The bills did three major things, and I'm not gonna go through all of them now, but basically they were bills to add new funding to create affordable housing, subsidized housing, and workforce housing across the state of California, and that's a permanent source of funding to replace the funding that was lost when the redevelopment agencies were put out of business, which had been 90% of, about 90% of the funding for affordable housing. They also um, strengthened rules relating to housing accountability, meaning that localities were required to add a certain amount of housing to keep up with population growth that hadn't been enforced for many, many years, so there were bil bills that were done to try to strengthen those rules, and also, bills to protect existing affordable housing. I voted for all of those bills, but clearly none of them are gonna solve our problem today or even tomorrow, and we have to do more in the short term and in the long term. I've introduced three bills this year to help create more housing. I'm not gonna go into them in de detail, but I thought I would take the opportunity just to give you a brief thumbnail. AB 2553 will help finance higher density, actually taller buildings, um, taller housing, um, in certain transit zones only in cities that opt into this and only if those buildings provide a certain amount of affordable housing within them. AB 2263 tries to do two things, to number one, protect our historic building stock and secondly, to encourage them to be converted to housing. What this bill does is it allows for buildings that are listed on the historic register to be adaptively reused without having to conform to today's parking codes. The reason a lot of our historic buildings have nothing in them is because they don't have parking lots, because they were built in the 20s or the 30s. This would allow cities to make that decision to put housing in them, or hopefully not a Trader Joe's, but something that's a low parking um, use, but without having them to have to comply to today's parking codes. And then AB 2782 would allow for the positive impacts of a project to be considered on CEQA documents instead of just the negative impacts. So what this would do is allow um, projects as, they, as they're proposed to have to quantify the negative impacts of not doing the project and the positive impacts of doing the project. Um, so um, CEQA is a planning document meant to inform policymakers, so it makes sense that the positive impacts of a project should be considered as well as the negative impacts. 
um, you can hiss, but we're still going to try to do the bill. <laughs> and, and, and I do, and, and let me also say, rather than hiss, if you send me or vocalize in a, you know, in a forum like this what your objections are, I am all ears always to hearing objections on ways that we can make, make legislation better. That's a, a more constructive way of, of letting us know how to do that. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn now to our amazing panelists. We have a great group of panelists here. They're going to introduce themselves, uh, but just to give their names, Professor Michael Manville is a professor at UCLA who studies these topics. Um, Cynthia Strathmire is the executive director for SAGE, and Scott Weiner is a senator from San Francisco. Uh, so with that, I'm going to first turn to the professor to give us an overview about our housing crisis and how we got here and whatever else he wants to talk about. That's about what I'll talk about. That's what he's talking about. Um, yes. Do we have a clicker for him, or should he say click, or how are we doing this? Oh, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll get it for you. And thanks to all of you for being here and for your interest. Thank you. That mic doesn't work, right? That mic is not working. Okay. I don't think. Okay. Um, I'm just going to sit back so I can actually see my slides. So I'm just going to provide a, a quick overview of, of one version of, of how to think about this, this whole housing mess we're in. There's a lot of different ways, perspectives on the housing crisis. Hopefully this one is useful. Uh, I think the way to think about it is that we actually have two housing crises in LA. Uh, one of them is, is older than the other one, and they're, they're related to each other, but they're distinct. And the first one has been longstanding, which is that we have always had, or have had for a long time, a lot of very low-income residents who struggle to afford rent. Uh, and they struggle to afford rent because their incomes are low, their incomes are volatile. Uh, we do not have a very strong social safety net, particularly when it comes to housing. Uh, we have not done a very good job of moving affordable units uh, into production. Uh, we don't have, we have huge backlogs for public housing, we have huge backlogs for housing vouchers. And so as a result, we have low-income people who the vast majority of them are renting in the open market. They're renting market rate housing, uh, and it's a struggle for them. And they are subject, being at sort of the bottom of the market rate housing, uh, to sort of abuse by unscrupulous landlords sometimes. And our tenant protections are often insufficient. They're often insufficient because uh, uh, sometimes these, despite the good work of a lot of activists, a lot of these tenants don't know their rights. And then when they do know their rights and they go to, to uh, sort of fulfill them, they find that the protections aren't very strong or they find that they're strong on paper and they're weakly enforced, right? And so that is, that's one of our crises and it is unfortunately not new. But it's being made worse, and it's being made worse by a second housing crisis. And I think this is the one that most people think of when they think housing crisis, and that's the fact that in the last few years, housing across the board has gotten more expensive. And so you find not just poor people, but middle class people, and working class people, and even upper middle class people struggling to afford their rent. And this has mostly happened because the demand for housing has gone up substantially. And it's gone up substantially because LA is a nice place to live, it's gone up substantially uh, because our economy has picked up steam after the recession, and it's gone up substantially because the millennials, who are demographically one of the largest cohorts we've ever seen, have started moving into the housing market on their own, moving out of their parents' houses. And that big increase in demand has not been met by a sort of corresponding increase in supply. This has happened during a time when we really haven't been building a lot of housing. And so what happens is that the price of the existing stock goes up, and that hurts almost everyone, it doesn't hurt people who happen to own housing, um, but it hurts people at the bottom of the income distribution the most because again, they're competing with everyone else for this, this housing stock that, whose price is going up. And so I'm just gonna, my first slide, this is from the California uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, just shows over time from 1955 to 2015, the, the extent to which our building in California has slowed down and the bottom lines are single family homes and the top lines are multifamily homes. Um, and what you see is that over time, we've, our construction, and particularly construction of multifamily housing, has really decreased. And LA is not an outlier in this. In fact, it's sort of a driver of it. And I'll show you this in the next few slides. Um, what these maps show is just the type of housing we've permitted in LA County, um, moving from, from world, basically from World War II forward. And what I'll call your attention to is two things that in this map you really can't see. 
dark red spots, um, which are, are areas where we've permitted very large apartment buildings, buildings of over 50 units, and dark blue spots, which are areas where we're building almost nothing. So this is uh, the, from 1940 to 1960, and what you basically see is a lot of light blue, which is single family homes. And then you move into the 60s to the 80s, and you see as we start to urbanize, there's a lot of brown, and those are sort of medium-sized apartment buildings. Um, and then you get to 1980 to 2000, and what you're starting to see is there's more dark red and there's more dark blue. And then in the last 15, 20 years, what, what's basically happened is we have this bimodal distribution of development that in, in most places we're building nothing at all, and in a small handful of places we're building, we're building very intensively. Uh, disproportionately building big units over 50, um, and, and those, are relate, those are related to each other. The one sort of causes the other, and I'm going to come back to that. So the question is, why did we progressively start to build less and less? And the short answer is that over time, for a bunch of different reasons, LA, the LA region and LA City in particular downzoned itself. That more and more areas of the city, in more and more areas of the city, it became illegal to build anything other than single family homes. Right, and this is a, a graph from Greg Morrow at Pepperdine who basically sort of used the change in community plans to show that, that the paper capacity of Los Angeles, the zoning capacity of Los Angeles steadily fell um, because more and more areas were converted to just single family homes. And if you look at a zoning map today, this is one that was put together by some of my colleagues. There's different ways you can measure this, but you see that the vast majority of this region and certainly the vast majority of the land in Los Angeles City is zoned only for single family homes. Oh, sure. So the, um, the, the yellow is uh, single-family home zoning, uh, the blue is multi-family home zoning, and the, the, the green is, is non-residential, um, either because it's just sort of not developable or it's industrial or something like that. And so, so there's a tremendous amount of, of areas that are mostly just for single-family homes. And this is, single-family homes are great, right? But the problem is, especially in a place where, where prices are rising, they're a very inefficient use of land. Right, they, 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 they take up a lot of space per person and they also prevent a big barrier to affordability because what they say is that if you want to live in a place, you have to purchase quite a bit of space. And I think sometimes people look at our single family home zoning and they just say, well, this is what the market is there for. People don't want to live in things, in other, things other than single family homes. But the zoning really does play a big role. The zoning is, in many places, a big constraint. And I think the best example of this is along Wilshire Boulevard. Um, this is Wilshire and Selby right near UCLA, and what you can see is that right along Wilshire Boulevard, there's clearly a market, a demand for people to live in very large towers, right? And right behind them, you have to live in a single family home. And I'm not putting this up to say that we should all live in large towers, I'm putting this up to say that the zoning really does matter. I mean, what this does, right, is that that, that, that very valuable land along Wilshire Boulevard, if you want to live on that land, you do have to be rich because that's expensive, but, right, you can share the cost of that very valuable land with hundreds of other people because we have built a dense tower on it. If you want to live right behind it, you, all, you have to be even richer because you have to pay for an entire plot of land in a house that you're just going to live in with one or two other people, right? So, yes, that's expensive land, but it's made less expensive on a per unit basis when it's dense. And so, there's, there's basically two consequences that occur when we just don't build. And, and I'll run through each one of them very quickly. The first one is, and I've mentioned this already, the price of existing housing rises because there's just more people who are competing for that housing. The second one, and this goes back to those, those dark red dots that I showed that are becoming more prevalent, is that the little development we do allow is like very intense. It tends to be out of scale with what's around it. It's highly visible. It tends to be expensive. And because of our complex zoning, it often requires the developer to get special permissions. All of that combines to make that development seem unhelpful and illegitimate, right? And it actually compounds the problem because it turns people against development. And we actually do need development to get out of this. It's not the only thing we need, right? But it's something we need. So just to illustrate the, the first point, which is that the price of the existing housing rises. This is, if you look at the census and look at the median rent, this is uh, for a unit that was built between 1980 and 1989. Uh, in Los Angeles, in 2013, this was uh, $1,269. By 2016, it was $1,424. That's a 12% increase. 
That is the sign of a broken housing market, right? 35-year-old unit apart, 35-year-old apartments should not be seeing double-digit inflation over the course of three years, right? And just to illustrate that, if you look at the U.S. as a whole, um, it was $905, and then it was $906, <laughs> right? So something has gone terribly wrong in L.A. And what's gone, what's gone terribly wrong, maybe it's Airbnb, but I don't think that's the whole answer. That people, there's more people for every housing unit, and the people who are want housing, that can't find new housing, are clawing their way back down the income ladder, right? And they're, they're forcing middle class people to move into working class housing and working class people into lower income housing and lower income people, at the worst of it, onto the streets. And so that's, the, uh, so that's what happens, the, the, the consequence of not building, the price of, of new housing rises, uh, of sorry, existing housing rises. The second consequence that I mentioned is that you get this, right? Like I mentioned, these dark red dots, too much of what we see going up is sort of this high-end luxury housing, right? And so for anyone like me who does think that, uh, you know, we need to build more, the prevalence of this stuff leads to some invariable skepticism, right? Where people say, you know, I don't see how this is going to get us out of our crisis. It's only housing for rich people. And I think the, the obvious counter, well, the, the most common counterpoint to that is that every little bit helps, right? That, that someone who moves into this unit is not moving into another one. I think that's true, but I want to make two different points. Um, the first one is that this type of development is in many ways an artifact of our development restrictions, right? When land is very, very expensive, and when you know, the, the permitting process can take years, and when we have very few places where we allow multifamily development or new development at all, those things combine to, to get you like very expensive new, new buildings, because the only thing people are going to lend for is stuff that's going to squeeze every bit of possible profit out of the, out of the land. Um, and the second point I'm going to make is that as, as hard as buildings like that are to take, right, when we see so many people um, that need housing and we see luxury housing going up, they're not why our city is expensive, right? There's just not enough of them to be responsible for why the city is expensive. And this is just another quick example from the census. Um, if you just look at homes that are valued at over a million dollars, it is absolutely the case that new housing is more likely than old housing to be expensive, right? Depending on which year you start from, I kind of measured from two th 2006 onward, between 17 and 52% of the housing built since 2006 is currently valued at over a million dollars, right? But the flip side of that, right, um, is that most expensive housing isn't new. And that's because we just haven't built much housing in the last 10 years. So even though the housing we've built recently is disproportionate likely, uh, likely to be expensive, it adds up to being just a small portion of our expensive housing. Like over half of the expensive housing in Los Angeles was built before 1950, right? So it took me about five minutes on Zillow yesterday to find that. That's a $1 million house in Venice, right? It was built in 1985. So there's, there's two ways to produce expensive housing. One way is that you, know, you go out and you build some fancy new building, and it sells for a lot of money. But the other way is to not build and let all the existing housing become expensive. And that's overwhelmingly what we've done in Los Angeles, right? And so the, and the way out of that really is to build more, right? It's not the only thing we have to do, but it, because the, the option, right, if you build more, eventually the price does start to come down. Certainly, and even if you don't believe that, certainly if you don't build more, there's no end to it. Like, the price just keeps going up. And so, so I do think we need to have more development, but let me come back to this idea of two different housing crises to, to make a point at the end, that solving this second housing crisis, that the, the over the, just the rapid rise of housing uh, costs, it, that's, building does that, right? And that's gonna help the first one. It's gonna relieve pressure on our most vulnerable residents. It is not the whole solution for the first housing crisis, right? We have a long overdue obligation to our most vulnerable residents that involves more vouchers, more affordable units, better tenant protections, money to make sure tenant protections are adequately enforced. Like, saying that you're going to build more does not take any of that off the table, right? Those, these, are, these are parallel tracks. But I would say that if you don't build more, that first housing crisis does only get worse. So it's a, it's an, it's a necessary, building more is a necessary but not sufficient way out of the crisis that we have. Thanks for your attention. Thank <laughs> you.
Professor, before we move on, do you happen to know what the statistics are of our population growth over time and our amount of units produced, roughly? <laughs> Not off the top of my head. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. That's okay. Okay. We're going to move now to Senator Scott Weiner from the Bay Area. Great. Thank you. And uh, wel welcome to the people booing, too. Uh, I, just so you know, I, um, hailing from San Francisco, we, we boo and hiss and protest with the best of them. So uh, as a longtime elected official in San Francisco, I'm, uh, I'm used to it, and it's all good. Uh, people can uh, love my work or hate my work, and that's what democracy is about. So I'm glad we're all here today in the same room. Uh, first of all, I want to thank uh, Assemblymember Laura Friedman. Uh, I will let uh, you know, for those of you who uh, live in her district, um, you have an absolutely superb uh, assembly member uh, representing your community. Uh, we, we came in the office at the same time, December of 2016, and, and have gotten to work together and, and talk about a not just housing, water, other issues, and uh, I've really enjoyed working with her, so thank you, Assembly Member. Uh, I want to thank all of you for being here. I was hoping that it would be a, a beautiful, bl bright blue sky, warm uh, LA day, and I could say thank you for being in here when you could be outside doing other things. Uh, it's not quite as nice, but, uh, uh, but seriously, thank you for taking your Saturday to be here to talk about housing. Uh, and I think that shows how important uh, this issue is. Uh, and uh, so I'm used to housing being the number one issue in the polls in San Francisco. It has been for a very long time. Sometimes homelessness will catch it for a minute, uh, but it's always about housing. Home housing is now the number one issue in every recent poll I've seen statewide, not just including our cities, but including uh, the inland parts of the state, including the rural parts. It's number one, followed by homelessness. Uh, this is a statewide issue. It is no longer an issue that impacts some cities but not others. There are fewer and fewer places in California that can truly be considered uh, affordable. And uh, I do want to just ask uh, for some participation. Uh, raise your hand if you think the housing status quo in California is working. Okay, maybe, maybe, may, maybe one hand went up. Um, while we might have some disagreements about about solutions uh, yep so uh, while there may be differences about how to address it I think everyone agrees that where we are what we're doing today and what we've been doing for a while doesn't work uh, and so it's a long overdue discussion that we're having about what to do uh, differently and that's what this is about this is about the evictions and the displacement that are happening. It's about families who have that second kid and have to le leave and be, are pushed into a two-hour commute because there simply isn't housing uh, for them, whether they're low income, whether they're middle class. Uh, it is about our economy uh, because our housing crisis is harming our economy. Uh, as companies uh, decide whether to expand elsewhere because they have no confidence that their workers will be able to find housing anywhere near where they work. And it's about our climate goals because you cannot talk about fighting climate change unless you're also talking about land use patterns and having less carbon emissions and people driving less. And that depends on housing and housing density and where people live. It's about the next generation and whether our kids are going to be able to live in the communities uh, where they grow up. It's about real people. And, you know, for a long time, I think there has been uh, a lot of nipping and tucking around housing. Uh, there are periodically big things that happen, but a lot of times people try to do a little bit around the edges, uh, in part because housing is really hard. For an elected leader or for anyone else, it is a hard thing to tackle because there is no such thing as a short-term solution. Uh, everything takes time and it takes years and years to, to play out. Um, so I think we need a new approach uh, to housing uh, because what we've been doing hasn't worked. Um, for about 50 years in California, we have taken the approach that housing is a negative thing for communities. We look at the negative around housing. Uh, housing has, uh, we look at the negative environmental impacts of housing without looking at the positive. Uh, we look at 
the traffic and the parking issues and that there will be more kids in my child's classroom. We look at the, the water issues. We look at all the negatives for decades in California without looking at the negative of not having enough housing. Um, we've systematically disinvested from housing, subsidized housing, for low-income people. The federal government has, but we in California have as well. And when the state ended redevelopment, instead of fixing it to focus it on affordable housing, that was a huge step backwards uh, for the state. Um, we have created obstacle after obstacle and have also pretended that if you don't build housing, the people won't come, as if housing is what brings people here. People don't move to LA or San Francisco because of housing. They move to LA or San Francisco because these are amazing cities where people want to be. And what we've seen is that even as San Francisco downzoned dramatically in the 60s and 70s, and then LA downzoned dramatically in the 80s, even as we've seen less and less housing being built in LA and in the Bay Area, people have still come and the population has still grown. They don't just disappear. And what happens is people still come and you have explosive housing costs, you have overcrowding in units, as units that were designed for maybe one or two people have six or eight people uh, in them, uh, and you have all the problems that we see today uh, with housing to the point where a recent estimate put us at a four million home deficit in the state of California, just about four million, growing by 100,000 homes every year. Uh, so I also just want to mention how I came to this uh, in terms of my interest in housing as a policymaker. I came to California, to San Francisco in 1997, um, as a lot younger than I am uh, now, and that was at a time when we saw the first dot-com boom in the, in the Bay Area, and I saw the carnage uh, when I was defending low-income tenants who were being uh, evicted and seeing that people who were losing their homes and had nowhere to go. There was nowhere for them. Um, I was the president of my neighborhood association, uh, and I would see, wonder, why, why do we have to have 50 community meetings to build an apartment building that's 100% within zoning? Why does it take five years to get something approved, even if it's within the zoning. Uh, and I wondered that, it just didn't make any sense uh, to me. And then I went on to serve on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors from, for about six years. Uh, from 2011 to 2016, during a period of absolute explosion of housing costs to the point where the average rent in San Francisco uh, is $3,500 today for a one bedroom apartment. And it's getting high around the state. And you know, the, this issue is it's a statewide issue and it requires statewide approaches. I, I want to talk a little bit also about uh, the difference between, you know, we have this debate, state, state versus local control. Um, you know, as a former local elected official, uh, I'm a big believer in local control in a lot of different ways. But local control, it, it's not biblical. When you look at how we do it in California and in many other states, it is case by case. It depends on the issue and it depends on the goal. Local, the goal is not local control. The goal is to get good outcomes, whether that's local control, state control, or some mix of the two. And let me give you an example. Public education. Housing is really important. So is public education. If, any, if someone were to come in here and advocate, you know what? We should, the state should get out of public education. Um, school districts should be able to decide how many days a year they educate their kids, what subjects they teach, uh, whether they have credential teachers or not. Just butt out and let the local communities do what they want. You would laugh them out of the room because we set state standards because public education is so important for our state's future. Same with health care. We set state standards and the local communities operate within those standards. Housing is an outlier where we have basically said for many years it is a purely local concern. Uh, local communities can decide whether or not they want to build any housing. And if they do build housing, they can build a little bit or a lot. We're going to leave it to local decision making. Maybe that used to work. It doesn't work anymore. And it creates a race to the bottom uh, where you have communities that over an eight or 10 year period produce essentially no housing. Uh, and it has helped get us into the mess we're in today. And I don't advocate a state takeover of housing policy, 
I advocate re-looking at the balance to have a balance where the state sets basic standards that are enforceable and local communities control is within those standards, just like public education. So as um, Laura mentioned last year, uh, we took a big step in the legislature, passing 15 bills that the governor signed, uh, increasing what we invest in affordable housing, and that was a huge step, and I co-authored those bills, and we need to do more, and there are more bills this year, and especially as the federal government under this horrible administration continues to undermine affordable housing, uh, we need to step in in California and support local communities' ability to invest in below market rate housing, uh, particularly for our low income and working class residents who are most at risk. And that has just begun. Uh, I'm a supporter of rent control and we need to strengthen rent control. Um, last year we also reformed the process, uh, both with my housing streamlining bill, SB 35, to say for communities that were not meeting their housing goals, they become streamlined. Uh, we had other process reforms, and then we made very explicit that inclusionary zoning for rental is legal in California and overruled the Palmer decision. But the job isn't done when 97% of California communities are not meeting all of their housing goals. We have more work to do. Um, so as uh, I know you know, um, uh, a couple months ago I introduced SB 827. There we go. Let's hear it. <laughs> so SB 27 addresses what is a pretty straightforward issue uh, that many cities, including my own, uh, often ban small and mid-sized apartment buildings near public transportation. That's what it's about. Communities that have said we are banning small and mid-sized apartment buildings near transit. And, and that when you zone for single family homes uh, only around public transportation, that is what you're doing. And we didn't use, and we didn't use. Please let him speak and then we'll go to questions. And we didn't use to do that. Uh, there are, there, were, uh, there was a time when in California a lot of these small and mid-sized apartment buildings were built. Uh, and then they got banned. They got, when the LA downzoned, when parts of the Bay Area downzoned, and said you're no longer allowed to build those apartment buildings. That means that fewer people, when you have low density zoning around public transportation, because public transportation is exactly where you should be putting housing if you're serious about getting more people on the transit, reducing gridlock, reducing carbon emissions, giving people the option of driving less. When you have mandated low density zoning, such as single family homes, um, around public transportation, all you're doing is saying very few people are going to be allowed legally to live within walking distance of transit. You're forcing more people to drive. You are pushing people <coughs> into long, often crushing commutes. Uh, you are increasing carbon emissions and you're increasing gridlock. The solution is for more people to live uh, near transit. Um, very low, uh, very low density zoning uh, around transit also undermines our quest for more affordable housing. Does so in a few ways. First of all, if you zone for single family homes or for two or three unit buildings, let's say, uh, you are saying that those parcels are not going to be part of an inclusionary housing program because typically there's a threshold. It might be 10 or 15 or 20 units is what triggers inclusionary housing or in the case of Prop JJJ, it's about apartment buildings. You don't get inclusionary on a single family home or on a two unit building. And so when you restrict, say, around this public transit station, only single family or two or three unit, that's saying no inclusionary housing in this neighborhood, period. It also means that for nonprofit affordable housing developers that are looking for parcels that they can develop uh, low income or moderate income housing, uh, they can't do that on a parcel zone for single family. So for some people who have said, well, if you upzone these parcels, it's going to increase the value and make it harder for a nonprofit developer to buy it, what I would say is right now, for many of these parcels, because they're zone low density, they are not an option 
for a nonprofit affordable housing developer to buy it because you cannot build multi-unit affordable housing there. And so th this bill, and by increasing the zoning density, you will increase the available parcels for every kind of multi-unit uh, housing. Uh, and so what the bill does uh, is it provides that within a half a mile of a major transit hub, like a subway station, a rail station, whether it's an LA metro station in LA, or it could be a BART, Caltrain, or Muni station uh, in San Francisco, or the East Bay, or the Peninsula in the Bay Area, um, you can build typically four to five story buildings, 45 or 55 feet in height, um, you can't limit the density, so you can't say only single-family homes. Uh, in a smaller subset, it'll be taller, uh, 85 feet. Uh, these smaller apartment buildings, particularly the four to five stories, uh, will be, uh, they are typically uh, wood frame construction. So when we talk about the buildings being built, a lot of times we have this dichotomy. You either build single-family homes or you build um, more of a, a high-rise that's going to be steel construction, which is the most expensive kind of construction and will make the project much more likely to have to pencil out at a luxury level. Uh, again, we used to build these four or five-story buildings all over wood frame, uh, and they are much less expensive uh, to build. Um, we will, uh, and I think I've talked about the benefits of doing that, and I think that's what we will uh, see. Um, I, I want to uh, just mention a few things to keep in mind. There's been a lot of, I, first of all, I never have an issue with anyone opposing any bill or idea I put out. That's what democracy is about. I do have an issue when there's inaccurate information that gets out about the bill. I, all I do is ask people to at least have the facts right. So I want to just mention a few things. Um, first of all, and this was always implicit in the bill, but we made it explicit last week by making amendments, uh, that the bill completely defers to local inclusionary and local demolition controls. Uh, if it, whatever, and if a community bans or restricts or requires a special process for demolition, uh, and different communities take different approaches, LA and the Bay Area, for example, are different, um, that will be completely respected. Um, in addition, uh, local inclusionary will apply, so when you make an apartment uh, a zoning, zoning denser, you're talking about more uh, inclusionary, if there is a local inclusionary program. Prop JJJ will be respected and accommodated in the bill. That was also one of the amendments we made uh, last week. Prop JJJ has been a uh, really, from what I can tell, a very successful and positive type of inclusionary program, and we want to allow uh, local communities to continue to take creative approaches. And so we respect Prop JJJ, uh, and that is uh, going to be deferred to uh, in this uh, bill. Uh, the bill uh, still allows a developer, whether it's a nonprofit or a for profit developer, to put parking into a building. It doesn't ban parking, uh, but what it says is that a local community cannot require that these transit adjacent buildings have parking. That significantly increases the cost of the construction. The bill allows uh, use of de uh, objective design standards, um, and the bill does not uh, change the approval process. The approval process that exists today will exist after this bill uh, is in effect, whether it is a CEQA uh, process or whether it is an SB 35 process, the process will remain the same. Um, I also want to, uh, and I'm just about done here, um, want to just talk about a lot of, after this bill was proposed, um, a, a lot of maps have been made, visualizations, and there will be more, and we're working with some people to put a tool out so people can type in their assembly district or senate district and get a visualization. And the visualizations are great, um, but there are two uh, issues when people see those visualizations. Number one, a lot of times um, what it does is it sort of, you, you see your city with a big blob on it saying here's the impacted area. Uh, and it doesn't overlay with the existing zoning. And sometimes, you know, there, the, you, an area is impacted, but it's impacted, for example, uh, you know, increasing the height by five or ten feet because it's already zoned, say, at 40 feet. Uh, and, and so people don't always see that. They just assume everything's going from, like, you know, 10 feet to 85 feet. And so you don't see that level of nuance in terms of what the impact is. Um, and then the second thing is people then say, oh my God, next year 
this is what my community is going to look like. It's just going to all change overnight. And we know that with development, uh, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and so we're talking about gradual changes over years and frankly decades because you have to have an available parcel, you have to have the financing, you have to have a plan, you have to get it approved. And so this is not some sort of overnight transformation that's going to happen over time. Um, so I do, uh, we do have some slides just showing some of these buildings, mostly in LA, and I think I, think I asked my office to make sure to put the, where it's from, mostly LA and surrounding LA uh, cities, uh, some in the Bay Area and elsewhere, uh, just what kinds of apartment buildings we're looking like, that it's not, it's not just about, you know, big mega buildings. So maybe we can just go through that. Oh, do I do this? Okay. So this one is in South Pasadena. Looks like it's about almost 40, about 40 feet tall. This is in Boyle Heights. I think that's probably about 50 or 55 feet tall. This is from, uh, this is from Stockholm. Uh, it's on La Brea. Looks like it's about 45 or 50 feet uh, tall. Toronto. This is this is in uh, this is in Beverly Hills. It's I think he's trying to show uh, scale well, and height. For one thing. And, and I think yes. honestly, a lot of the buildings are historic because, as I mentioned before, in many of these communities, these buildings we used to build a lot of them, 30s, 40s, 50s, and then we banned them, and so there aren't a lot more recent ones. And the one. And the ones we build today, in 100 years, people are going to be saying, oh my god, that's so beautiful, and don't build the new kind. Not this one, though. Not that one. This is in Santa Monica. Seattle. And Seattle, by the way, has uh, really increased its production. Seattle rents are going down. San Diego, Koreatown, Long Beach, and w and for the next town hall we can have a an architectural design uh, debate about uh, aesthetics. Okay, so anyway, I'll I'll end there. Um, and I, again, I want to thank everyone for being here. Whether you love well, you love what you're doing, what we're doing, or you hate it, um, it's a really important conversation, so thank you. And before, before, we, move to, before we move to our last speaker, um, Scott, just because it's sort of an elephant in the room, one of the comp um, uh, arguments people have had or concerns they've had about the bill is gentrification through the loss of older housing stock as a developer will come in want to tear the building down and build something larger. So, so how, sh sh hold on, hold on. And, and I will point out, we have gentrification issues and we don't have the bill yet. So, uh, um, you know, the question is, will it exacerbate it or will it not exacerbate it? Go, 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 go. Hang on, hold on, hold on. Um, I think we all hear the concern. And I'm one, uh, so Senator Weiner, how do you, how do you address that concern? Uh, sure. So, uh, and I think that is an important point. There are, you know, communities where we have not been building an enormous amount of new housing uh, that are experiencing intense displacement. And so, uh, you know, I think we really, that it's happening now. Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do believe that when you don't have enough housing, you fuel displacement. But uh, in the bill, the amendments we put in last week, um, as I mentioned, um, in terms of uh, demolitions and, uh, ref and you know, respecting local controls on demolitions, as well as respecting local inclusionary housing, including Prop JJJ, um, we also did put in, uh, and we got this uh, from, from LA, and I want to thank LA for, uh, for um, coming up with this concept, the, what's um, called the right to remain. Um, that if you, uh, that people, I if there is, if you are displaced because the city of LA has allowed uh, for a demolition, then the developer has to put you up and can't pay any more than you were paying 
uh, for up to 42 months, and you have to be allowed to return to that parcel into the new building at an equivalent unit at the same exact rent. Um, and we got, again, we got that from LA. And, and, and I will also say that we continue to be all ears. Um, we, uh, we welcome particularly constructive, specific ideas. Um, to, you can email them to us, you can send it to me on, uh, on however you want. Um, and we will absolutely look at it and we, uh, you know, we, we, welcome, we welcome feedback. So, thank you. And before we move to um, to our last panelist, I, I just want to clarify two things for people that are listening, because we're throwing a lot of kind of lingo around. Inclusionary housing means where you require the developer to subsidize some of the units, that they're either for people for, uh, affordable, um, either at, for workforce housing or low-income people, that the, the rents in those units are subsidized. That's inclusionary housing. And a lot of cities are adopting or have inclusionary requirements for new development, um, not all. And the other thing I will say is when he talks about what we don't allow, I think what, what just to be clear, what the senator is saying is that it used to be, you know, 100 years ago you could build pretty much whatever you wanted anywhere. And over time, the cities have done what's called down, down zoning, which means that they've reduced the amount of housing that you're allowed to put or the, the type of development you're allowed to put on different parcels around the city. And they've done that enormously. We looked at it in Glendale. And over the years, parcels about every 10, 15 years or 20 years, pretty reliably, they would downzone areas. So they got to a point where we are now where not only can't you build apartment buildings in most parts of the city, you can't even build the existing housing in most parts of the city. Uh, about 80% of the housing of the single family housing in Glendale are what's called existing non-conforming, which means you couldn't even build that house today on that lot. You would have to build something much smaller or something set back further. Um, so. Um, it, the idea was to, it, it was done absolutely to restrict building. I mean, that was done consciously um, many, many times over the years. And in Los Angeles, where he says we've banned it, you cannot build an apartment building in a single family neighborhood. You would need a lot of variances, and generally you're not going to get it. So when he says that, it's not that he's saying that you can't build any apartment buildings anywhere in Los Angeles. It's just that the places you can build them are very, very restricted. So with that, I will move to our last panelist. Hi, my name is Cynthia Strathman, and I'm the Executive Director at SAGE, Strategic Actions for a Just Economy. Um, and <laughs> Thank you, that was nice. Um, and we're a, we're a nonprofit in South Los Angeles. We've been there for 20 years, and we focus on the economic rights for working class people. And we've particularly focused on tenant rights, healthy housing, and equitable development. I'm um, sorry, it sounds like I'm taking off to outer space. Um, <laughs> we focused on tenant rights and healthy housing and equitable development. And um, we're, we're a membership-based membership organization. Most of our members uh, live in the area, that South Figueroa corridor in between USC and downtown Los Angeles. And they're mostly very low income, mostly monolingual Spanish speaking immigrants. Um, household incomes run a little under $20,000 a year. And uh, we got into housing um, work because we saw so many problems um, with housing for our, our, our members. And um, you know, every week we run a tenant clinic, um, sometimes twice a week. We see over 300 families every year. And they're living often in very dire ho housing situations, very overcrowded, um, often very neglected. So they have vermin infestation problems. You know, people, kids have come in with rat bites. One of our partners, St. Johnswell Child and Family Center, they regularly pull cockroaches out of kids' ears. Um, and and th these, are caused, these situations are caused by housing pressures. Landlords aren't under a, are under a lot of, um, you know, landlords don't feel a lot of obligation to keep, keep uh, the premises up. Um, increasingly, people are very scared of eviction um, because, uh, because, you know, if, you, if they get turfed out, um, you know, the landlord could potentially replace them with somebody who was much wider, much more affluent. We're actually involved in a lawsuit with one landlord who we feel is violating fair housing laws for exactly those reasons. And it's, it's actually ironic because there's been a huge building boom um, um, north of, of the city, and, or north in the city, and, and also um, around USC, and, and yet, well, not so much building, but it's more like, yeah, there's some. Anyway, um, mostly in the downtown area, and um, it hasn't really helped that situation too much. And I think it really points to the, the origins of the housing crisis 
for lower income folks like ours, especially people of color, in two different situations. Um, and you know, the first I think goes back a long way into, into our regulatory framework um, and into very exclusionary housing policies that divided the city up along racial lines. Um, you know, my family's lived here off and on for a long time, for around 100 years, and you know, back in the late 1940s, my grandparents were trying to buy a house, and um, they were, my mom actually remembers the house. She says it was great, it had a big yard, it had a swing, she was like, this is gonna be fantastic. And they were told, you know, you can buy the house, you can own the house, but you can't actually live here because this area is for whites only. Um, and that was very common at the time, is these restrictive racial covenants. And so that's why you see a lot of lower income people of color concentrated in South Los Angeles. But the regulatory framework's really only half the story because the other is really market forces. And so, you know, I mentioned that there's all this new housing in downtown Los Angeles, but even though there is a lot of new housing, it's really not housing that any of our members can afford to access. Um, I mean, even, even if, um, you know, even if you cut the prices by 25%, they wouldn't be able to afford to access it. And their proximity to it, even though they're living in the aforementioned not especially fantastic housing, has actually pushed the rents in that housing up. So there has been a big gentrification effect there. Um, so that's, that's sort of my sense of how we got into this housing crisis. But you know what? What can we do to fix it? And I think we really want to hone in on, on building housing that ordinary people can afford to live in. I think transit corridors are an ideal place to build this. Um, and in Los Angeles, a lot of the tenant rights groups have been banding together and trying to promote a three-pronged approach to this. And one is the production of more affordable housing, especially along transit lines. Um, we, we've been advocating for things like funding streams, for establishing inclusionary uh, requirements, which Senator Weiner mentioned. Um, we've also been advocating for the preservation of housing that's currently affordable, um, housing that's covered by the Rent Stabilization Ordinance in Los Angeles. Um, doing things like creating no-net loss zones, regulating demolition and condo conversions. Um, we would really like to see the brakes put on short-term rentals, which are taking housing units off the market and turning them into hotel rooms. And also the protection of tenants, enhancing the enforcement of existing tenant protections and passing new protections for tenants like just cause eviction. Um, so there are some real life examples of this happening in Los Angeles. The Senator mentioned Measure JJJ. We've been working on affirmatively furthering fair housing requirements. Um, the community plans for South and Southeast LA, which sound like small things, but they actually cover 500,000 people, which is a pretty significant, over 500,000 people. That's a good chunk of people. Um, and you know, we spent years getting community feedback. Um, SAGE did with the Unidad Coalition. We've successfully advocated for things like affordable housing requirements, a ban on oil drilling, which you would not believe the amount of oil drilling that still happens like in the city of Los Angeles in low income neighborhoods. Um, and and we're, we've been making some progress, but there are some real dangers to these. And a lot of these are, have very recently been passed. We've only just starting to see some of the fruits of this work. Um, and one is that there has been an increase in market rate housing production, which I think you're aware of. You know, you can see it in the cranes along the skyline. Um, and this does tend to have a gentrifying effect of driving, when the rents in one building increase, you'll see like a rise in rents in the, in the buildings around it. Um, a, a lot of the market rate housing, um, as has been mentioned before on the panel, doesn't really serve low income people. Um, and if you, were, if you were a developer, you know, it kind of makes sense. Like if you were a developer, what do you want? You want to buy cheap land, right? Which means you're probably better off buying it in lower income communities. And then, um, and then build stuff for rich people who have more money to pay for it. So I'm not a fan of this, but it does make sense from a developer's perspective. Um, I think that uh, there's another danger, and this is just around the transit issue. We really want transit ridership to increase. I think that that's a, like a, a goal for most people. I don't know anyone who would just say, I don't want transit ridership to increase. I mean, some people might not care that much, but no one's against it. Um, and I think there's a problem with maybe building transit oriented development that doesn't cater to core riders that you can get people who are living along those transit lines that aren't, that aren't necessarily gonna use it. You know, one of our, our allies described, you know, being in your TOD, um, a transit oriented development, I talk only in letters these days, only in letters. Um, <laughs> a transit oriented development in Koreatown and just watching these luxury cars come out of the parking lot. You know, it's like a Lexus and a BMW. And that's, it's not really, I mean, it's 
not really for poor people apparently, but how do you get the, make sure the people are living in that transit-oriented development are taking the transit lines and not either driving or, or taking Uber or Lyft, which is like a whole other rant from me, but we'll do that some other time. Um, and I actually, you know, and I know we're, we're here partly to talk about SB 827, and I, I have concerns about the bill. Um, I, think, I think several of the tenant rights groups, and I'm gonna go through some of them. Um, you know, there was a mention earlier of it driving up costs near transit lines and making it difficult to build affordable housing there. Now I know right now no one can build anything there in some, in some cases, and that's a problem, but it would be nice to see it targeted in a way so that you have um, some sense that affordable housing will have to be built there. It, it could end up being a real windfall for the owners of some single family homes which I think is particularly problematic in some parts of South LA where you have a lot of land owned by big corporations like Blackstone, who owns hundreds of homes, single family homes in South Los Angeles. They are now one of the country's largest landlords. Um, they bought up tons of, of single family homes in the wake of the financial crisis. My older son thinks their name is hilarious. He said it's like a combination of all the villains from the, from the Born Identity movies. Um, <laughs> but it is actually their real name. Um, I'm a little worried this bill would, would take, a, I keep saying I'm a little worried, I should like, for, this is like, this is like a, an alliance of, of tenant rights groups have, have, have like sort of compiled these concerns. We're worried about it taking away um, affordable housing incentive, incentives like the density bonus. Um, we're also worried, I, I appreciate the effort to like not impact Measure JJJ, but it would still impact some of the local efforts we've made to, um, to get more affordable housing like the community plans that I had mentioned before. And I, it's, it doesn't see, it, the, the bill as it stands is not making a distinction between, I think, more well-heeled parts of town with sort of nimbyish single-family homeowners that we're trying to like introduce more density to and then low-income parts of town that could really be hurt by it in terms of the gentrifying pressures because they're different in those different areas. Um, and because of the way it's structured now, it could lead to some displacement in low-income areas as rents in the area rise, and then you, it sort of, it could incentivize landlords to turf people out and then raise the, build, uh, the building and then build something. Um, and the buy right is, man the, 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 the mandatory, the upzoning is mandatory. I'm sorry, it's not buy right, it's upzoning. The upzoning is mandatory, but the affordable housing is optional, and the tenant protections are geared towards RSO jurisdictions, that's rent stabilization ordinance jurisdictions. Um, but those are less, th those are less than 10% of the jurisdictions in the state. Um, and so, and, and in Los Angeles, a lot of the, the really wealthy areas, which I, I kind of feel should be taking more of, the, the, of their share of high density development, they aren't really situated along the transit lines. And so, so all of this, this um, um, the, these critiques are, are kind of geared to the central issue for, for for us, and particularly for Sage, which is I think if we really want to solve the housing problem, we want to address the problem that we're trying to fix. And that problem is a lack of housing that people can afford. We've, you know, we've, we've, we've hit our targets in Los Angeles for the above moderate rate housing. We want to hit our targets for the low and very low income housing, but we're under a third. We're under a third of what we need to build to hit those targets. Um, and so, I think if we want legislation that's really gonna target wealthier, wider neighborhoods that haven't really produced their fair share of housing, and I'm just gonna say, I think that's true, um, we need to have um, you know, buy right legislation and upzoning for those areas. And, and, and try to exclude the areas where there's lower income people of color that could be really vulnerable to the gentrification pressures of new development. Um, and you know, if we want people on trains, I think we really need to try to figure out ways to just get them on trains and not hope they'll take trains if they live near trains, which could or could not happen, um, depending. And, and just to, to try and not be completely negative, um, you know, as is your want, where you're like, would you like to come critique the bill? Sure, I will critique the bill. Um, but to not be totally negative about this, I think there are actually a lot of things the state can do to, to, to help. I think a buy right for permanent supportive housing, we would be completely behind. I think buy right or upzoning and for high density developments in high income census tracts, we would be really supportive of. Uh, reformation of the Ellis Act, which would help prevent evictions <laughs> and demolitions of rent controlled or stabilization units. Um, repeal of Costa Hawkins, which is a law <laughs> that prohibits municipalities from expanding rent control or rent stabilization. I think we could use some state legislation on just cause eviction. Um, 
I think allowing government agencies to provide shelter for the homeless without a cumbersome process involved in that. And I think any, any upzoning measure should include significant value capture in that legislation. Um, and and so, so in sum, I think we're, we're very pro, we're not anti-development, we're pro-development. We wanna see the higher density, along, especially along the transit lines. We do believe that LA needs more production. I know that not everybody agrees with that, but that's the position that we're taking and I think it's an informed position. Um, but I, I, we really wanna see it done in a thoughtful way so that we're building the things that the people who are really most in need, need at the, you know, building the right thing in the right place at the right time for the people who really need it. And that's. Thank you. And, and I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna ask the senator uh, to maybe respond to some of that since it's a lot about the, the bill. Uh, uh, sure, um, and, and first of all, thank you for the work uh, that you do for, uh, you know, for so many people who are in need. And, uh, we, and in LA, I mean, there's a massive poverty problem, uh, you know, and in the Bay Area, we struggle with it um, as well. And, uh, you know, we're, when we're talking about our, our low-income residents, these are folks who are the most at risk of being pushed out, the most at risk of becoming homeless, uh, and uh, we need to be there for our low-income uh, neighbors. And I, uh, and I, I'm of the view, and and some have disagreed with me on this, but I I believe it that when it comes to low-income residents of, in especially expensive cities like L.A. or Santa Monica or San Francisco, um, the market uh, will not produce housing affordable. Uh, to low-income people in a lot of our cities, uh, and uh, you know, it might back in the day the market did. It doesn't. It doesn't anymore. Uh, you know, who knows if we'll ever get back to the point where it does? But right now, and for the foreseeable future, uh, when it comes to housing low-income people, that is why we need to massively invest in affordable housing for low-income people. Uh, and. <laughs> And I, you know, I've supported that with my with my votes, and we'll, I'll continue to be um, uh, to to push for that both locally and at a state uh, level, um, and uh, and we have to do that. So that's I think common ground that we absolutely have, and it also is about inclusionary. Uh, and I've always been a supporter of inclusionary uh, housing, uh, and that is another powerful way of creating. Uh, units uh, that are affordable to low-income people, although the only way uh, that you get inclusionary units is to allow uh, the market rate development to happen because that's what pays for it. So, it, it, and ideally you want it to be a symbiotic thing where you're producing both. Um, but what I will also say is that uh, as we work very, very hard to keep low-income people stable in their housing, to make sure that it is housing that is safe and healthy, uh, that people aren't getting kicked out, um, and I, you know, I've 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 been uh, very public that I um, support uh, the work that has been happening for a long time to try to change the Ellis Act. Uh, I think that Costa Hawkins needs a lot of change, um, and uh, and so we have to do that work. But in addition, not instead, but in addition, when it comes to our middle class, the middle class. Um, Housing subsidies, subsidized housing, is not going to solve our middle class housing problem. It is too big in scope. Uh, and if we try to start using housing subsidies to, for middle class housing, first of all, it's not going to move the dial because the middle class is just too big. But apart from that, that means that we won't be focusing all of those resources on low income families, residents. Uh, and so when it comes to the middle class, the way we're going to address that problem is by simply having enough housing being built so that people aren't commuting from Riverside to LA unless they really want to do that, which some people want to do that, but people shouldn't be forced uh, to do that. Uh, and so I, I, you know, I, I, um, you know I, I think there's a way to thread the needle um, I, uh, to make sure that we are building both because we need to build uh, both and you know and, and I think it's also important to keep in mind that in terms of what the effects are of this bill a lot of it is on the single family home uh, and low density zoned areas a lot of our um, uh, you know in a lot of those areas uh, are, are right now you s simply can't build any apartment building whether it's um, for low-income people or market rate 
And I don't, you know, in terms of Southern California cities that um, we probably would not define as low income that will be affected uh, by this bill, and that's why some of them are fighting it really hard. Uh, Beverly Hills, they're fighting it really hard. Average home, 3.4 million. Santa Monica, Westwood, Brentwood, Culver City. Uh, in my neck of the woods, uh, San Francisco, some of our west side and north side areas that are zoned only for single family homes. Uh, I'm, getting, I'm getting some booze up in San Francisco too because people don't want the change. Palo Alto, Berkeley, Tiburon. Uh, so there are plenty of uh, wealthier communities that will be affected by the bill. It's not, it's not only. Um, and so, uh, you know, but we look forward to continued feedback, uh, and, and, we, and we appreciate that. I take everything that you said to heart, so thank you. Thanks, and just to give some um, scale, so in Glendale, when we build affordable housing, this is um, subsidized housing for people of lowest income level, so you have to qualify to be able to apply. For every unit that we have opened in the past several years, we get between eight and 10,000 applications of qualified residents, that's for each unit. These are people that right now are housing insecure um, around Los Angeles who are low enough income, you know, making, I, I couldn't tell you, but somewhere, you know, in the thirty dollars to $40,000 range and below um, who apply. And we have tens of thousands of people on the Section 8 waiting list for those vouchers, and the federal government is not issuing any vouchers. So um, at the same time when the funding for all of this has pretty much dried up from the federal government and the state's trying to help, um, that subsidized housing is just not going to be built in enough quantity to solve this problem alone. So my question for the professor and anyone else who wants to answer is, why is every new building a luxury building? You know, why does that happen? Is it purely greed or is there something else happening that means that every building that is created is, uh, you know, renting at $3,500 and up? Who's building for the middle class right now in Los Angeles and why? Uh, not many people. Um, I, I don't. I don't think it's just greed. Um, I, I think developers are self-interested, but most of us are self-interested. I mean, most of us probably don't do our jobs for no money. Um, and, I, and I think that, although it's easy to say that, and, and I should also point out, not there's some very salient, like very highly visible, outrageously expensive buildings going up. They aren't all the buildings that are going up, right? But they're the ones you notice, and like the, the one that I showed, that ad, I mean, just Looking at it online, I threw up a little bit in my mouth. I mean, they're, they're disgusting. They are. I, there's no question about that. But the fact is, right, there are places all over the country where very greedy people make lots of money selling housing to the middle class, right? It's, it, it, you, you can be incredibly self-interested and, and, and driven entirely by money and not sell things to rich people, right? So that can't be the only explanation. And I think a big part of it does come down to, uh, I alluded to it briefly in, uh, in my talk, and I think the senator alluded to it as well, which is that when we say that only a small number of places can have this housing, and when we've created a situation where um, you're, you can build very little by right, and the land cost is going to be high, and you're going to look at one or two years of delays, what you're going to finance, uh, what you're going to be able to get financing for is a very expensive units, right? That, that if we could build in more places and build a little bit more easily, there are, un we know this, there are underserved markets for people who don't have $3,500 a month for a unit. But, but it's very difficult for people to get the financing to build for them. And so I think that's a big part of the reason, and, and the senator mentioned as well, that once you've committed to sort of going as dense as you can on these small parcels of land, um, you've committed to steel frame construction, right? It's, it's super expensive. And so, uh, and that, that, that's a part of it, right? Um, and so I, I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I saw a statistic that to build an apartment building in Los Angeles, just a simple apartment building, not a luxury building, just a simple building, is between three and five times more expensive per square foot than building a luxury house, single family house up in the hills. And that's taking in the cost of the land, what it costs to get the building entitlements, when you put in all of those wonderful green standards that you know I passed and voted for and a lot of people voted for, but it you know, adds cost, that's what you end up with at the end of the day. And so you, know, you can't rent those for $1,500 a month. Um, I you know, think that there are a lot of us in Sacramento that are working on ways of trying to bring that cost down so that it can be done and find ways to 
sort of not without putting public money into, but giving the types of incentives that would allow that kind of housing to be built. But that's the missing middle in housing. Uh, either building the subsidized housing for people that are below the poverty level or around that line, or building for people at the highest end of the spectrum. But that middle class housing, I just don't see very much of it being built at all. Yeah. So with that, I'm going to move to questions. And we're, we're, we have this huge stack. And there are people walking around taking your questions. So if you want to ask a question, raise your <coughs> hand. We're not going to get to all of these. So what I'm going to suggest when we don't get to some questions, and I'll try to paraphrase some and get through them quickly, is that you come up and put your email address on them. And I will, we will hand them to the right person up here who can respond to you via email. That's the best that I can do. Um, but keep, keep them coming. So we have a few questions about historic properties and historic overlay zones and how that affects those um, in, in, the, in the bill, in 827. So Mr. Uh, Senator Weiner, if you could answer that. Uh, uh, sure. Um, so, uh, it, well, so are you talking about the actual parcels in terms of, well, I, you didn't write the question, so I guess you don't. Uh, in terms of, again, in terms of demolition, uh, local rules are, will govern. Uh, and so, and I, whatever the local rule is, uh, that will govern. Um, I believe, and I apologize, I don't have the text of the bill in front of me. Uh, I believe the bill excludes uh, parcels where there is a property that is, uh, is on a historic register, say landmarked um, locally or, uh, but, uh, but I, let, well, yeah, let me go back and I'll go, I'll go back and look at that. Um, but, uh, uh, but in terms of demolition controls, the local rule will govern whatever so In other words, the, the bill doesn't take away the ability of a locality to protect any particular parcel and say it can't be demolished or it can only be demolished under any circumstances. I also, okay. Uh, no, I understand, a historic preservation overlay zone. So if a, if a lo my, I'm, I'm gonna, I mean, I'm assuming that if a locality says that you can't demolish buildings it would, in It's whatever the local community has adopted as the rule, if you're talking about demolitions, if you're talking about um, a, a vacant parcel, uh, then it will, the zoning will change in terms of the density. Hey, hey, the, hey, hey. The zoning, hey. the zoning will change, but the, but the, uh, but the approval process, the approval process will not change. Uh, and so in LA, for example, currently under SB 35, uh, LA um, is streamlined, not for market rate, uh, but for low income and very low income. Uh, and so uh, it, a market rate project, for example, would not be, you'd have to go through CEQA and whatever the local, there's a conditional use process or whatever the case may be. So it will not change the process of approving it. It changes the underlying zoning. Okay, so that is a distinction I think that's important. Um, and, and, and oh, okay, we, can, we can't take questions from the audience. I've got a big stack of people who turn questions in. We're gonna, cause, because these are the questions from the audience. We're taking them in this form. Wait, 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 wait. We're taking questions from the audience, people who have turned them in. So turn them in if you have them instead of shouting them out. People have been writing these down. Well, you know what, let's, let's ask, let me ask this, because I think from some of the questions that I've seen, from, wait a, wait a second, I, I, he I did an, answer I answered the question. the question and you, dis and, you and you disagree with the answer, which you're entitled to. It changes the underlying zoning on a parcel. That's what it changes. It doesn't change the approval process. It changes the underlying zoning. No, that, that, that you're entitled to your opinion on that. That's, that's fine, but I've told you what it does. Okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let, just to clarify, the, building, the, the bill would still, this is not my bill, but just from what I've heard, the bill would, uh, would, would not prevent a locality from denying the demolition of any historic structure, so the, uh, or any structure. A uh, city could say, we're not going, you know, you can't tear that down, for instance. 
But if a building is gone or if it's an empty parcel, that's where the, the underlying zoning would change. So if someone was going to put, if there was an empty lot in an HPOZ, you wouldn't be on, only able to build a single family house. You could build something larger. That's, that's what the bill does. Okay, okay. Now, I, I think because we've had a few questions about this, I would like the senator to explain within the bill what, uh, what, wh where this is triggered. Because a few of the questions said, well, we have a bus stops in our area, but it's not just any bus stop, right? Can you define, how does the bill define a high quality transit in terms of 827? So where are we talking about? What, what are sure. those high quality, as the bill calls it, transit corridors so that we understand that, you know, is it every single neighborhood in LA and which neighborhoods is it and what, besides the train, you know, the subway is obvious that if it's a transit stop on a light rail, that's triggered. But what else? What does it look like in terms of the buses? Um, sure. So yes, it's it's within a half mile of the if it's like a, a subway, rail, ferry uh, kind of stop, uh, then that's the half mile. The quarter mile zone is around uh, what's called a high quality bus stop, which we we did not create that definition in this bill. That's an existing uh, definition under state law. Um, I can guarantee you the definition of a high quality bus stop will be a subject of negotiation and. Uh, evolution in this bill uh, that is uh, uh, so stipulated that w uh, but we we started with the existing definition that California state law uh, provides and that means uh, it's defined as a bus stop uh, where uh, there where the headway or the frequency is at least every 15 minutes or more frequent uh, uh, during uh, you know peak hours rush hour um, and as I mentioned the, the, this will be a subject of discussion and evolution in the bill. I'm, I'm confident. Um, the, you know, obviously, when you're talking about subway stop, rail stop, et cetera, that is a much, you know, I think, less controversial in terms of what qualifies as something of significance. So not every bus stop, just to be clear. Um, yes. Only your busiest corridors. And with a bus stop, it's a quarter mile. That's and correct. And the trans, OK, I didn't realize that. OK. OK. All right. Um, let me let me continue. Hey, the the rush hour times, yes. The yeah, I would like to. Can, if you. Right, and that, and that, and that will be a top, that's already a topic of discussion. So that those issues are very much part of the conversation around that the high frequency bus stop definition. And uh, so that people understand where the bill is, we're at the point now where the bill's been introduced and there are amendments being taken. So where, where are you talking with people on, on terms of addressing a lot of these concerns? Um, so we, uh, we've been talking with many groups, in, including a number of the members of ACT LA um, and uh, groups in LA and the Bay Area and, and elsewhere. Uh, and we, uh, and we uh, so the bill was introduced about 60 days ago. We are likely to have our first policy committee hearing in early April. Um, we made a series of amendments last week in direct response to feedback that we received. Uh, the, net we, the next set of amendments will probably happen as part of the committee uh, process. So people can uh, convey constructive feedback. If people wanted to suppose the bill, I, I completely, like I said, it's democracy, I respect that. But um, if people have specific ideas that we should consider, uh, you can send us a letter, you can email it uh, uh, to my office. Uh, you can, you know, we, we, we do read everything that comes in. And, and sometimes, you know, a letter comes in and has an idea that you'd never thought of before. And, and that's what an open process is about. And we, we welcome that open process. Could a city, if SB 827 was imposed, would a city be able to say that anything taking advantage of, like, building over 10 units had to require inclusionary? Could they make that specific or, um, to the districts? Are they able to do that under this rule? Well, um, the, the city can apply um, its inclusionary rules of general application to these projects. So if, if a city says uh, that 10 percent of units, let's just pick a random number, 10 percent have to be um, affordable to whichever income level, moderate, moderate low income, et cetera, um, then that would apply at a larger scale uh, on these buildings. Uh, and it would bring buildings that are not, are currently too small zoned 
you know, if you zone for single family, it's not part of inclusionary, you're going to bring it into the inclusionary uh, program. If, if a city decides, uh, as, as LA has sort of done, to do it differently in different parts of the city, um, that would also, whatever the underlying inclusionary rules are in a city, whether it's a blanket percentage over everything, whether it's a Prop JJJ kind of system, whether it's different percentages in different neighborhoods or different percentages to different size uh, buildings, uh, there are a lot of different ways that an inclusionary program can be structured uh, and uh, whatever it is that would apply to these the same as it will apply to uh, uh, existing. Okay, we have uh, a couple of members, I think of the Redondo Beach City Council here, I think their mayor is here as well, um, came and in I, all the I way. Met, I met with, I, who, with whom I met, so we, we and, and, they had, and I appreciated that feedback. So they have a question. The yeah. question is, uh, density is the key issue where housing is and where jobs are and that creates traffic. Redondo has the density but no jobs. Well, some jobs, I think. Um, we have Section 8, retirement, all types of housing, None of your bills address the school issue, infrastructure issue, and jobs housing ratio. So they wanted to know um, how your bill would help them use their local control to balance all of that. Um, well, no, the bill doesn't require zoning for commercial or, or zoning for, um, uh, for jobs. And I think uh, communities uh, you know, have different strategies for how they try to achieve uh, jobs, housing, balance, there, there are cities that have linkage fees, there are cities that have a certain requirements uh, in terms of uh, commercial development, uh, and that those would, uh, those would still apply. Um, we, we actually took a look, Redondo Beach is minimally uh, impacted uh, because it, it has one area, I believe. Uh, I will say, uh, and what I've, what I've uh, but where, where Redondo, and I've spoken to Redondo Beach about this. I have a different bill, SB 828, uh, which reforms RENA, the Regional Housing Needs Assessment, uh, because currently, when we assign these housing goals, it's very uh, politicized. And so communities that have more juice politically are able to negotiate down their numbers. Uh, historically, communities that are wealthier tend to be able to negotiate down. For example, you may have seen uh, in an article recently that the city of Beverly Hills uh, received a RENA housing goal for an eight-year period of three units. Three units. Redondo Beach got 1,400 units compared to its neighbors. Like one got two and one got 37. And so we're trying to, uh, and, and we're trying, 828, and we're trying to make sure uh, that these housing goals at all the income levels, including low income, um, are based on actual population income projections. Uh, and that we also move away uh, from, uh, in some areas, I won't name names, including some in the Bay Area, where a county will put a lot of its low income RENA goals into one community instead of spreading it into various communities. And, and we want to move away from that and have more, a more equitable approach to housing. You know, something that I've heard a lot, I'm going to address this to the professor, I've heard a lot that, that, a lot, that some of our, that, 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 that there is no shortage of housing, that people are just holding units vacant, and that if they didn't have those vacant units, we wouldn't have any problem and the rents would go down. Where are we with actual vacancy rates in Los Angeles? Have you seen any data? Uh, yeah, I mean, the, the census, I mean, it varies a little bit from year to year, but the census puts us at about 4%, which is low. A vacancy. Yeah. So, so we don't have an artificially created, I mean, not, it's maybe artificial, but in terms of vacancy, there's not thousands of units all over the place sitting vacant. I, I don't think so. I mean, I think that, some, and I don't know where, where this comes from, but I think sometimes you hear that, that a lot of, uh, like for instance, there was something in the news not long ago about how downtown's new buildings, downtown had a high vacancy rate. Um, that it was like 18% or something like that. Well, it's, I think I would, I would put it a little differently. I think downtown's vacancy rate is actually just really volatile. That like sometimes it's 18%, and then you look at it two quarters later and it's seven or 8%. Um, and I think the reason for that is that downtown is both very small and has a lot of building. And so if you have a small area where a large, like a, a substantial proportion of the housing there is housing that's relatively new, then if two or three buildings come online in one quarter, you know, the, the, the first day a building is open, it's 100% vacant. 
Um, and so you could have like 500 vacant units suddenly, and that's just gonna spike the vacancy rate. And that's why if you look two quarters later as the new stuff gets absorbed, the vacancy rate goes back down, and the new buildings come up and they go back up. But that's, that's really a neighborhood effect, right? Um, the, in our region, vacancy is very low. Uh, if, it, if it wasn't, you know, we just wouldn't be seeing this sort of price escalation. And are you only seeing um, gentrification in areas where new luxury buildings are coming in? Or is that something that happens? Which, what's the chicken and the egg equation there? Any data on that? I'm allowed to ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> I can be the audience. Sorry. Go ahead. Um, so it, that's, it's, it's hard to tease out that we definitely see, you know, uh, and I think Cynthia mentioned that there, there seems to be prices rising right around where the new buildings are in downtown. Um, but we also see like prices have risen really, really fast in Venice. And Venice has actually lost housing units. And so, well, so it could be Airbnb, but the, the question was whether it's caused by new development, right? And so that Airbnb, which I fully support restrictions on, is not new development. Right, it's someone just taking units off the market, right? And so we also see it in Echo Park, we see it in Silver Lake. There's plenty of areas where there hasn't been a lot of development, where we've seen price appreciation every bit as fast as areas where we see luxury development. Now that doesn't mean that there's no sort of indirect effect in some neighborhoods when someone builds a luxury unit, right? If someone does suddenly go into a neighborhood that didn't have a lot of investment and puts up a really fancy building, there probably is some sort of signaling effect there that says like, hey, you know, rich person, you can come live here now, right? But I, the reason I say probably is because it's, because what we see in Venice and in other places suggests that if that housing wasn't built, we can't rule out the fact that people would move there anyways, right? That, that there's, so it's hard to say that the entire effect is the effect of new development. That's what I mean. So it's, you know, the chick there is a chicken and egg problem, um, but I think it would be inaccurate to say that we're only gonna see gentrification in places where we put up fancy new buildings because we're seeing too much gentrification in places where we aren't doing that. Okay, let me move on to yeah, questions. Right. Sure. Um, I mean, I don't think you'll only see gentrification in places where you see new development, but I think it's likely that you will and which is why if you do do the develop, new development, you wanna be sure that you have some sort of, of anti-displacement measures in place mm -hmm. around that new development. I, um, I think also I would take a little bit of, okay, this is just a semantic difference, a, a, an interest, a more broader view of maybe of development. I mean, if you have an apartment building where they're gonna try and kick out all the low-income Latino families, rehab the building, put wider, richer tenants in it and flip it, like is that, still existing construction or is that like it's almost like a new building oh, okay, um, yeah, it, and, and in a way you know we, t we when we turn ho you know housing into hotel rooms or something else it's like building yeah. something different there that, so that's but a that's a great point and that I should clarify what I mean when I'm talking about development I'm talking about like adding units new construction right so if someone just go, if some landlord goes in and they're like hey I could make a lot more money like kicking, I mean, oftentimes that results in less units, right? Because a landlord will say, I want to kick a bunch of walls out, right? And, and, and make this fancier. And, and you actually see like a net loss of units to convert to a short-term rental or to convert to condos or something like that. When I say development, and I thank you for bringing this up, what I mean is like, we're going to build some new units. There's going to be more housing here than there was before. Okay. Um, what about the unintended consequences of eliminating neighborhood commercial and retail and putting in housing, which your bill might do, um, on a, you know, intentionally or not. Um, okay, so a couple things. <clears throat> First of all, uh, the bill does not change uh, the um, the use type zoning. So if a uh, if an area is zoned, it has to it has to at least be partially zoned for residential to count. So either fully residential or mixed use. If it's zoned industrial or um, only commercial or only office, that the bill does not somehow convert it into residential uh, zoning. In addition, if a community uh, has a requirement in place for a par parcel that uh, this has to be, you know, one third um, retail. Let's say there, you know, communities sometimes will zone 
in, in, in commercial areas that they want to have ground floor retail uh, and housing um, above it. This will not um, override that. Uh. It, 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 changes, it changes the height and density. It doesn't change whether it, there has, if a community says there has to be a mix. Let's say you just put up an apartment It's still an apartment building if it's ground floor, floor retail. There are a lot of apartment buildings with ground floor retail. Yeah, well, why don't, if you, if you wanna, like Laura said, put in that question, we'll get back to you and, 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 and answer that question So, so is it because, uh, just to, uh, ask his question again, if that's okay. So if a community says that you have to have a certain amount of commercial in a building, you're saying that that would be maintained. Yeah. It would increase the amount of housing that would be allowed. Yeah. What about an area that says it has to be commercial only? That if, it, if a parcel is currently zoned, it can only be commercial, nothing else can be there, or it can only be industrial, <clears throat> or it can only be retail, that will remain, this, this bill doesn't include those parcels. It only includes it if it is zoned entirely or partially for residential. And that's in the bill? <clears throat> that's in the bill. Okay. Mid-density and co-housing in LA, it says how to unlock the many lots in LA with one story building along commercial axes. Melrose, Beverly, and many more. Why mid-density is not desirable by landowners? They'd rather block their land, question mark. Um, uh, in Habit LA, a co-housing group could not self-develop in LA as land is gridlocked. Um, I think that's a question. Oh, I said, Senator, how to unlock? Does this affect that at all? Uh, can, can you repeat <laughs> that? <laughs> um, I want to make sure I'm answering. I'm just, I'm just reading it. Uh, it says that I, I think it sounds like the there's not maybe it's. It, I'm, whoever's here, is that saying that in certain areas because they don't allow housing, it's only retail, that it's a waste of land? Is that what you were saying, whoever you are? They may not want to be announced. All right, they may not want to be announced. That's okay. All right, okay, I, I think that that's what they were asking. So well, it, Again, it, it would depend on if it, if it is zoned for at least partially uh, residential, then it, it would, it would, the zoning would change in terms of the density and potentially the height. Uh, and, uh, you know, if someone were building a co-housing project, presumably they'd be able to do so. If it was zoned only for retail, like that's what the zoning is, then it would not change that designation. Okay, why, somebody asked, why don't developers just buy land in less desirable, less expensive areas and build non-luxury apartments? Why aren't they doing that? Or are they doing it? Anybody want to answer? I think I mean, I, you know, I, land costs in LA are, are pretty high everywhere. Um, so I, I don't know that that, op I mean, you do see that happen in Bakersfield and out in the Inland Empire and so forth. Um, I, just, I just don't, I think that at this point our land market is so overheated that that's just not really uh, as much of an option. And can I, I would, I would add that there's a, there's a lot of rich people in Los Angeles. So I, I can't, you can't sell land I mean, if you live in Venice, you could sell your bungalow to Julia Roberts, and somebody did. But if you live in Bakersfield, you're probably not going to be able to do that. And so there's the, the market, I think, is different because we have so many wealthy people here. And I, I, going back to, to what I was saying, of you can buy land cheap and build something really swanky that you think you can get someone fancy to move into. Why would you not do that? Not that I'm advocating that. I'm just asking. Well, and, and I'll just add that and the fact that people know that means that there's not much cheap land. Right, that because like because people do want to buy land cheap and sell it high, the sellers know that too, and so the price of land goes up. Any ideas? I'm looking at the professor. How do you reverse that? <laughs> <laughs> so yes, yeah, spot zoning is a big part is is a problem. That's for sure. I mean, the fact that um, for years uh, people have been rightfully thought that if they buy a land zone for, for one thing, um, they can get it changed to something else. That en encourages land prices to rise in places where they might not otherwise. But I think that's, you know, that's only part of the story. If, if the short answer, as I mentioned, is you really wanted to reverse it, is that we just have to build more housing, right? I mean, the, um, when, the, when the price of something, 
I mean, normally when the price of some commodity or service rises, like we react to it by using it more intensively, right? I mean, that, that like if something's, if cars become more expensive, people buy smaller cars or they buy fewer cars or gas becomes more expensive, people drive a little less. But we have a system in Los Angeles where even as land becomes more expensive, we have zoning laws that force people who want it to consume it in big increments, right? That's what single family zoning does. Right? And so we're not allowed to react to rising land costs by buying smaller amounts of space. We're only allowed to do that in tiny portions of the city. And it's these, these larger portions of the city that are mostly in the affluent parts, mostly on the west side, that they protect themselves by saying that if you want to live here, you have to buy a huge amount of space. And that makes the housing cost in sync with the land costs. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can have lots of housing on expensive land and the housing won't be expensive. But we have made that almost illegal in most parts of the city. I'm also, I'm gonna also um, <laughs> challenge all of you to drive around or walk around or bike around just LA, just this part of Hollywood and see how many empty lots there are. How many lots that are being used for parking or lots that have a teeny little old shop on it that could be housing and just think about that for a minute. So it's not, you know, it's not that we have to tear down, always tear down housing to build new housing. Uh, sometimes you can, there's a lot of other things that aren't being used for living. Cynthia, do you think you could be inclined to support SB 827 if it could be modified to be more protective or exclusion, exclusionary of low-income communities or of low-income residents? Do you think you could somehow come on board if that could happen? It's a question from the audience. <laughs> so, Going back to my thing of, I think you need the right tool for the right job. And my concern is how you would modify a bill like SB 827 to be able to achieve that. Um, you know, the senator at some point said, you know, if people, some people are just blanketly philosophically opposed to the bill. And I think the position I would take more is that we're blanketly methodologically opposed to the bill, that, 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 that mandatory upzoning is going to be hard to alter in a way that would do that. I mean, I, I guess the analogy I would use is, is it's like we need an ambulance and you're getting a bulldozer. Like you can kind of kid the bulldozer out to be an ambulance a little, but really it would be better if you just started and made an ambulance. And I. I, I feel like there are ways to do the things that the senator wants to do, and I really actually applaud the sentiments that have driven this. We want to see more density along transit, and we certainly want to see more housing for, for middle and lower income people. But I think it, hypothetically, if you could tailor a bill like this to only, to, to not impact low income communities of color in a, in a negative way, then of, like, why would I say no to that? I'm just concerned of whether that's possible to do with the bill in the way that it's been constructed. So that's. And, and since local demolition controls are ex now explicitly respected in the bill, uh, I, I would just disagree about the bulldozer analogy. Um, but but I, I appreciate that, appreciate that feedback. Maybe, well, maybe I should have used like a, like a, like a, minivan or something less okay. less inflammatory <laughs> <laughs> okay and we're gonna have to wrap up in a minute like I said we are gonna if you want to come up and put an email or f on your card uh, I would uh, encourage you to do that so you can get an answer directly from whoever you ask it from I will ask the last question because something I'm really curious about as well um, somebody asked what other approaches are being evaluated that would have less impact on neighborhoods and they said have you asked our leaders in Washington to discontinue the incentives for foreign investors in the US housing market wealthy overseas investors have helped drive hard-working families into poverty and we could stop that with legislation overnight so I don't I mean is that true could we stop that how would that work does anybody have any thoughts anyone know anything about it well so there are a lot of things I would love Washington DC to do <clears throat> around many issues, but including around housing. Uh, the sad reality is that Washington has been withdrawing, <clears throat> federal government's been withdrawing from support for housing, particularly for low-income people, for many, many years. Uh, and even under uh, Democratic presidents and Congresses, maybe we've had some improvements, uh, but not a lot. And so, yes, let's all work to change our federal government and then uh, to really make positive change federally on housing. 
But I also want to, I, I want to be very, very clear in terms of my perspective on this. <clears throat> uh, California's housing crisis is not the fault of the federal government. You know, the federal government has caused many, many problems. <laughs> you know, whether you talk about the deterioration of the, a lot of the social safety net and, uh, you know, problems around the, in terms of uh, tearing apart immigrant families. There, there are many, many bad things that the federal government, that we can legitimately blame the federal government for. Our housing problems in California are largely the result of decisions that California has made. And we need to look in the mirror and not just say, let the federal government fix it. And I, I'm not suggesting that that question says it's only the federal government. But there's always a tendency to say, you know, we, we want our neighborhoods to stay exactly the way they are and that there's, and there is a way to fix this problem without building anything. And I am here to say there is no way we will ever fix this problem without building a lot more housing at all income levels. We have to map, <laughs> and, and, I, and I, think we are, I think we are fooling ourselves to think otherwise. And that means a massive investment in housing for low income people, for very low income people, for formerly homeless people, for our low income seniors, public money, and inclusionary housing to build a very large number of units to, to make sure that low-income people have housing integrated in our neighborhoods. Uh, we need that. We also, for our middle class in particular, need a lot more housing overall. And we need to move away from the system we have now, which is you either build these tall, steel frame, hyper-expensive buildings that become luxury or single-family homes. We need to get back to the middle, which is what SB 827 does. It is largely about these four or five story uh, wood frame construction, a lot cheaper construction style. Uh, you have a lot more of that, and over time, uh, prices stabilize and come down. Uh, but you know, anyone who tells you that there's an overnight solution to our housing problem, this is why a lot of politicians don't want to talk about housing, because it's long term. Uh, it's taken us decades to get into this mess. It's going to take us a long time to get out. Uh, but we absolutely have to create a lot more housing in the state of California at all income levels. All right, this has been this has been a really robust discussion. I want to thank you for your enthusiasm. I want to thank. I want to thank, and there's, you know, we will, uh, there's a lot of other issues we weren't, well, we haven't talked about that are certainly worth talking about, but I want to thank this amazing panel for giving their Saturday and for the senator for flying down here for this. Thank all of you. I want to thank LA City College and I want to, and their amazing staff for helping us and the sheriffs for being here today. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you.